My name is Margie Adam. I'm 63 years old. Today's date is the 6th of June, 2010. I'm in San Francisco with my beautiful lesbian mother, <laughs> Phyllis Lyon. My name is Phyllis Lyon. My age is 85. And uh, today's date is the 6th of June, 2010 in San Francisco. And my relationship to this wonderful person, Margie Adam, whom you should hear sing, uh, is as a friend and as a, and as a uh, fan, actually, over many years. I was 15 when I came out as a lesbian. And when I went out looking for my people, one of the first things I found was a magazine called The Ladder. And inside that magazine was your name. When I think of you, of all the ways I think of you, I think of you as my welcoming committee, that you welcomed me into the world of woman loving in so many ways that have made me, helped me become the open-hearted and open-minded woman I am. I'm so happy for the opportunity to talk with you today. And I'm just as happy to be able to talk to you as if we hadn't talked before, but not like this, I guess. Uh, Coming you out. You had never told me about that. Well, I, you know, this has been an opportunity for me to think back. You know, when was the first time I ever saw your name or heard about you? And it was in print. It's really made me think about the different ways that lesbians come out. Some of us know from very early age that we're, that we love other women, that we're drawn to girls, all of that. And some of us have no idea that that's true until <laughs> we meet someone in particular. Let's see, how is it for you, Phil? That's about the way it was for me. I certainly had no idea. Uh, as I said, I'm 85, so when I was in school <clears throat> many, many, many years ago, they weren't teaching anything about sexuality, or I don't even know if they ever mentioned the word, goodness gracious. And so I had absolutely no idea, and I didn't really find out about le that lesbians existed. I had a vague idea that uh, one of the boys that I had been in a drama class with and who committed suicide had done it because he was a homosexual. And I remember thinking that that was a ridiculous reason for God's sakes, why, you know, would that happen? But uh, I never heard the word lesbian. I never had any idea that women could be attracted to women, although I, when I think back on it, I do recall <clears throat> that there were times when I had some sort of a little inkling, but I didn't know what it meant or anything and so on. And it wasn't until... Uh, I was in my well, mid-twenties, sort of, that um, I met the woman that I spent the rest of my life with, and that was Del Martin, uh, who came to work in the place in Seattle that I was working as an uh, associate editor on a magazine up there. And <clears throat> I was excited about her coming up there because she was from San Francisco, and so was I, and so I thought that was exciting. And uh, so one day, uh, and we were all, all the women in the sh shop or in the business were excited about her coming. And uh, so one uh, evening after work, uh, Dell and I and uh, another woman we worked with, Pat, uh, went off to the press club to have a after work d and before dinner drink. And we sat there chatting away and having our drink. And, um, and Del, somewhere along the line, got on the subject of homosexuality. And so as she went on and on about this and so on, and one of us, I don't know, if, I don't remember if it was me or, or Pat, said, how come you know so much about this homosexuality? And she said, because I am one. <laughs> and we all sort of went, oop. 
And uh, so that was, and I think she must have then used the word lesbian. What was it about her that got a hold of you? What was it about Dell? Well, you mean as as a person? As a person. When we, yeah. Gosh, I, I don't know. Um, she was a very interesting person. I mean, <laughs> she knew a lot, mm -hmm. and she was from down here, and we were up in Seattle, and. Uh, uh, were you surprised when you actually found yourself moving towards her? That the energy between you was not only emotional but also physical no, and sexual. It, it, I don't think it became uh, physical or sexual or anything mm -hmm. else. At the beginning, I mean, I had to stop and think about what in the world does lesbian mean. <laughs> I mean, you know, how dumb can you be? I really didn't know enough about the situation to really figure out what. In fact, in fact, when I got home that evening, I called all the women at work and said, guess what I found out tonight? Dell's a lesbian. And they all mostly said, oh, well, that's good, or that's nice, or something or other. And the only problem that came back was one woman whose husband said, well, after that, she could never have anything to do with me again, as well as long as I had anything to do with Dell. There was only that one, huh. there were about five or six of us. So, uh, so I hadn't, re you could tell I didn't have a mm -hmm. clue as to what I should be doing yes. or should not be doing. But you fell in love with each other. You moved into each other. Well, that took about three or four years. About three or four years. And at, at some point you had to have told your mother. No. Never did mention it to my folks. Never? They no. They figured it out. I, so Somewhere I'm, around when you put out the book Lesbian Woman or? Well, I don't know when, but no, before that, I think. Because we were all living, to, we were all living up here in, uh, in San Francisco at that time, so and they weren't dumb, and uh, but I was, I was still a little bit confused as to what you did about things like that, and I just let it go, huh. and uh, so I never did have to tell them. They obviously found out. They obviously knew that. I told my sister. Dell told her sister. Uh, so our sisters knew, and they didn't care. Mm -hmm. They were fine. I'm going to change the subject just right. a little bit. You can. I'm going to take you off into two years into your relationship with Dell, meeting another lesbian, and finding out that there was a gathering of a few lesbians, which then in, e evolved to the founding of the Daughters of Belitis. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, we got together in 1953 on, on Valentine's Day. It was Dell's idea. We'll never forget our anniversary, she said. And uh, we never did. So, uh, but we also wanted to meet more lesbians. And we didn't have any luck. We went to the lesbian bars and didn't get, I mean, we were too shy to go talk to them. And they didn't come around and talk to us. So it was kind of a losing battle. Uh, we did meet a couple of gay men that lived around the corner, and occasionally we went out together. And one time we went to a after-hours party where we met <coughs> and talked with, for quite a while, with uh, another lesbian, which was the first chance we'd had, really. And um, so we gave her our phone number. And then very shortly after that, we went looking for another apartment. Instead, we bought a house. And... Uh, I mean, we, Dell wanted a view, and this house has a terrific view. So. Yes, it does. Uh, so in September of 55, uh, we got a phone call from this woman asking us if we would be interested in coming to a meeting with six other couples, no, five, six other women, six, yeah, six other women to start an organization, a social organization. And of course we said, yes, yes, because that meant we were going to meet more lesbians. And it turned out that 
what they what they wanted was to have a a social organization really, and they were going to call it the Daughters of Belitis because of the fo of the poem by uh, the French man whose name escapes me, uh, the Songs of Belitis, and uh, and they said because nobody else would know what the name meant, but all the lesbians would because every lesbian knows about that. We'd never heard of it, so we didn't believe that all lesbians knew about it, but. And so we went to the library to find out. <laughs> so DOB started as a secret society, lesbian social club. Right. But at so some point there was a split. Well, there was a split in the sense that we we had a problem. Well, first of all, Dell and I got in, involved in, we found out about the two male organizations that were existent, that Mattachine Society, Mattachine Society, and one incorporated down in Los Angeles. And... Um, we discovered also that there were a lot of laws that were anti-gay and a lot of things that needed to be done and so on and and uh, that there were more things to do than just party and uh, we also had trouble we lost a couple of members because they moved away and you know the original people and, and then it was hard to get other women to join because they were afraid to and <laughs> so in order to, we finally decided towards the end of the first year, we had gotten a few new members who were very good and, and, and worked really hard and so on. And uh, we decided we needed to do something besides what we were doing, which was mostly having parties at our mm -hmm. house because mm -hmm. we had the space and so on. And uh, so we... Uh, we decided we'd put on a newsletter and that we would uh, also um, have some kind of, what was, what was the other thing? Why is it escaping me? Uh, the newsletters and the discussion groups and? Well, no, the newsletters, the newsletter was one. Oh, and then we decided that we would have a series of lectures and uh, we had help from heterosexual women that we knew, and and one of them got us a, our chiropractor got us a, a good space to have these lectures, and and we got uh, friends that were uh, like Dr. Blanche Baker, who was a psychiatrist and who was so heterosexual, but was to wonderful. Come. Yeah, to come and <laughs> speak about how it was okay to be lesbian or gay and so on, all of this kind of stuff. So what you were doing with early DOB was going directly at these biases that lesbians well, after were the first. seen as, as illegal, immoral, and sick. sick. And so you began to organize on purpose to address those prejudices. Yeah. And also get more members. I mean, I, may, I, may, I think I'm major... Uh, need at the moment was to get more women involved, more lesbians involved. When I read the latter magazine, I was struck by the fact that I had to be 21 years old in order to order it. It was very, very hard on me to lie, to write to the latter and lie that I was 21 years old. And I also made up a fake name. You know, it was my address, but a fake name. I don't know what I thought I was doing with that little <laughs> detail. But so desperate, as so many of us were, to make contact with other lesbians, right. but also terrified because it was illegal. DOB had a, its first national conference in uh, 1960 in San Francisco. Right. You told me once about that story with the San Francisco sex detail and all of that. Well, <laughs> that was... So we finally decided that we got enough membership, and, and the latter, which we had not expected to turn into a magazine, had turned into a magazine. Oh, before, I, before we go on, I want to ask you about Ann Ferguson. Well, I was the first editor of the, of the latter, and uh, I thought, oh, God, if I put my name in it, then it'll be on the newsstands. Now, it never got on the newsstands, for Pete's sakes, but... And I thought, and maybe Dad and Mom will find it, you know, which was pretty stupid. So I decided I'd better take a, a nom de plume. 
So I took my middle name and mother's uh, maiden name, Ann Ferguson. I lasted about four issues. And the fact was that when we had the lectures and people would want to meet Ann Ferguson, and then Dell would call, Ann, 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 Phyllis, and I'd turn around. So that was a stupid thing to so do. So you had to kill her off. I killed her off. <laughs> the latter was started out as just a, as what we thought was just a newsletter. And, and the first issue we did on the Managing Society's uh, mimeograph, and we, uh, I think we got about a hundred copies of it. And we mailed it to every lesbian that anybody in the group knew, because that's all we knew, you know, if they knew somebody somewhere. And I remember hearing from one friend who was in New York or D.C. at the time, when she got her first copy, she said every month when it came, she, all these other lesbians in the city descended on her house because she wouldn't let them take it out of her house. And, um, but they didn't subscribe. Hmm. And we had, we had said in the first issue, if you would like to get this issue, uh, continue to get it, um, send us a dollar. It was a big deal. And send us a dollar and we'll put you on our list. So it, it just, it began to grow after that. Mm -hmm. So, and then I was the editor for a couple of years and then Dell was the editor for a couple of years and then we had lots of different editors over the years. Would you talk a little bit about the first DOB national well, conference the, the in San Francisco? national conference was in, in 1960. By that time we had uh, a couple of chapters in other places. There was one in Los Angeles, and I've forgotten where, uh, one someplace else. And we wanted, New York, we figured we could have uh, chapters all over the country as long as people, more people got to know about us and so on. So uh, we, we rented the Whitcomb Hotel, the top floor of it, which had a great view and had a, not only a place to have a conference, but also a dining room. And uh, we had it started out with a meeting, with a luncheon, I think, in the dining room. And uh, Dell and I were entering, and so on, all of a sudden we saw these two guys that were from the sex detail and the police department. We knew them because we'd talked to them before. And these are the same kind of guys that would be rousting women in the in the lesbian bars, doing gay yeah, raids. Yeah, yeah. So, and so what they said their problem was that they wanted to make sure that nobody, no women were here dressed like men. And, <laughs> and we said, well, look around, you know. And they sort of looked around and they left. What was and the issue of women dressing like men? It was a lot. It was illegal to wear the clothes of the opposite sex. Uh, now, and and in those days, women did not go downtown in San Francisco without having on heels and gloves and hats and, and all dressed up. You, know, you went downtown. Are you saying that all the lesbians at this conference were dressed up? Well, they weren't all like necessarily dressed up. They all had on... Uh, dresses and stuff. Some women, we found out, had never had a dress on before. I'd been working for a company that um, did export-import, and I decided I wanted to quit that and do something else that was more interesting. It wasn't really what I planned to do with my life. <clears throat> so, so I left, and uh, it turned out that uh, Glide Church here in San Francisco had, at that point, had started an organization called, uh, oh darn, now I, I keep forgetting these names I know so well. Uh, anyhow, they, they started a separate uh, Urban group. something? Urban? Uh, something like that. Something, but just, yeah. But this was about bringing uh, the, more progressive religious leaders into a dialogue with the LGBTQ well, community around. Not exactly. It was. Oh, no. It was to, the whole idea was to bring in ministers from other parts of the country, 
and introduce them and get them to know all the different kinds of people that were here in San Francisco, the blacks, the Hispanics, and also the LGBTs. And they hired me as an assistant because I was a lesbian, which I thought was hysterical. And, <laughs> and it was very handy, too. And uh, I spent quite a time there and ended up uh, with Ted McElvin, and we started a, 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 a class, a course in human sexuality, and then uh, moved it from Glide into a separate place that still exists, the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. But um, there was a fundraiser that took place, um, which many of us feel like was really, really predates Stonewall. There was a fundraiser that took place with religion. Well, yeah, that, as a re, yeah, as a result of of being involved with Glide, which was a Methodist church, still is a Methodist church. Uh, the only Methodist church I know of that is so open to gays and lesbians and hoo haws. Anybody <laughs> uh, is uh, Ted McAvena, one of the ministers that I worked for. Uh, thought it would be a good idea. Maybe we might want to get together and talk about starting an organization, like, you know, like the Council on Religion and the Homosexual. And uh, so we did have a meeting, and we did decide we were going to uh, start something like that, the, those of us who were at this meeting, and uh, which was, I think, Dell and I were the only lesbians there. And uh, we... Uh, We, t we told them um, we, we need to make money. So we decided what we would do would be to have a, a dance. And we were... That sounds innocuous. Yes, right. We, we rented a place downtown. Ted and some of the other ministers went down to the police department, told them what we were going to do, told them it was going to be just a dance. It wasn't going to be anything. They didn't need to get excited about it, blah, 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 blah and so on and so forth, and they thought they had convinced them that there wasn't going to be any problems, and they didn't need to create any problems. But um, the police department lied a lot, I think, <laughs> to them. And uh, when Della and I got there early, and there was not, we were a little surprised to see that there were several paddy wagons there uh, parked around. But we went on in, and we were taking tickets. That's what our job was. We were the ticket takers. And we had arranged it so you weren't, nobody was paying. They all had gotten their tickets ahead of time and so on and so forth. We were following every law in the world, I think. And uh, as time went by and people were coming in, we, we began to notice that people were looking very strange. And they'd come by and give us their tickets and stuff, and they, they looked sort of startled and sort of scared and so on. And it turned out that the cops had lined up along the, there was a big set of stairs going up to the front door. They'd lined up on both sides. They had flash uh, spotlights shining on everybody. They were taking movies, films of everybody going in. And a lot of people saw that and just went on by. And uh, so, uh, this must have really radicalized part it, of the community I, well, that may I, have been stepping, may have been not as involved to see that. Certainly, because these are ministers walking in there having their pictures taken, right? This right. Just wasn't well, gay people. Was no, no, no. They were gay people. But also, there were the there, ministers were already there. The ministers right. came out and talked to the police, and they they were furious. The yes. ministers and their wives. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing them all lined up on the front there and t telling the police to go away. Uh, we were really mad at the whole thing. And uh, they arrested a couple of people. And I must say for San Francisco that when we got into court, the people that were arrested were all let go. I mean, the <laughs> court was just... They they never got any further than than the the way that those of us who testified on the side of the gays and so on and so forth 
Uh, it never got any further than mm -hmm. that. And the judge just called it a quits mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. These were people going to a, a, a party who were all lesbians and uh, homose all homosexuals. And the homosexuals weren't supposed to get together. So it was actually the issue of assembling yeah, a whole bunch assemblies. of gay people assembling. Basically. Wow. Wow. And uh, the court wouldn't have anything to do with that. In 1972, you and Dell published a book called Lesbian Woman. And the dedication read this, to the daughters of Belitis and to all the other daughters throughout the world who are struggling with their identity as lesbian woman. Still, still <laughs> gets me. Is there a story behind that particular title? Well, I don't recall how we decided. I think we wanted to, to have a name we, we wanted, we had seen something, a, a company in New York, a book company, had wanted uh, to see uh, something about homosexuality. And we wrote to the guy and said, you know, yeah, there's, a, there's some books out on homosexuality, male homosexual, but nothing on lesbians. We would like to do a book on lesbians. And so he talked to us and looked at what we said we wanted to do and said that was fine and so on. And uh, so we uh, went up to our little cottage that we rented up in Jenner and uh, spent a month up there writing the book. Now, a month? What? It took you a month to write? And only a month to write that book? Well, we were only going to do it in two weeks, but my, <laughs> my boss said, why don't you? I said, can I get two weeks off to go write a book? And he said, take a month, you know, so... So we did, and uh, and then we got Sally Gerhardt to look it over to sh make sure we hadn't done horrible things in terms of the English language and so on, and uh, and then we eventually by this time the guy that we were working with with the book company had left, and there was a woman in his place, and she had said just go right ahead with what you're doing, you know. And, so that was fine. And they had given us a check for $1,000, so we were happy. And uh, so we sent the manuscript back to her. And the next thing we knew was we got this letter back from her that said, uh, you, did, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. You didn't do anything you said you were going to do. You have to rewrite the whole thing. It's terrible. It's awful. You're somebody blah, blah, blah. And so on. And we're going, huh? And, she, and then she, and she's saying, and you have to send the check back. So we thought, ooh, on you. And we went down and asked uh, Don Kuhn, the Reverend Don Kuhn, who was head of Glide Publications, if he would publish it. And he jumped all over us because he said, I would have published it from the beginning if you'd only given it to me. And, uh, and so they did. They published it. We never gave the $1,000 back to that <laughs> other book company either. Of all the responses you had to that book, that you've had to that book. What are the ones that have been most affecting for you? What have been the ones most gratifying to you? Well, it was amazing. Mostly how difficult it was for so many women to get the book. Uh, I mean, they'd see it, but they didn't dare, like, they didn't dare take it out of the library, but they would get it in the library, and then they would hide it somewhere so they could go back and finish reading it. And funny, funny stories of uh, how b young women went and found the book in the drugstore and a paper, when it came out in a paperback, which is why it, it got so, so much, uh, was still, you know, there were so many copies. And I remember this one group, and they found it, and they were all lesbians, apparently, and they were back east somewhere. And they didn't know quite what to do, and they thought, well, we'll just get a bunch of books. So they got a whole bunch of books and put them <laughs> together in a pile. And, of course, when the woman was checking them out, she was taking them one at a time. <laughs> and that didn't seem to bother her that they were getting this book called Lesbian Woman. But we heard from so many people uh, that it saved their lives. And I'm still, every now and then, somebody will say, you know, your book saved my life. 
I remember being in the San Fr uh, in the Chicago airport and seeing the book there among all the rest of the mainstream books and just crying my eyes out. It was so moving for me to see that that one book moved a whole community of people within the LGBTQ community right into the mainstream with that one single book. So you did work. You went on. You and Dell continued to be involved very actively with the Democratic Party, with the uh, uh, women's movement, um, with the civil rights movement, um, through the 80s, through the 90s. But in 2004, you step back into the limelight. You got a phone call from Kate Kendall of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. What was that call about? And what happened next? Great story. Something to do with you and Dell stepping out and maybe the mayor of San Francisco wanted to have you come oh, down there. Oh, oh, that. oh, that. Well, we had not been fans of getting married. Uh, we had done all the other stuff. We, we'd been, you know, signed up for partnerships and whatever and whatever and whatever there was. But... Um, we were with the feminist movement, and the feminist movement was anti-marriage, so... Uh, because? Well, because, the you know, they felt that men took a hell of an advantage over their wives, and which I think was true, and and, uh, and women didn't really have a way to fight back, uh, some women anyway. And uh, so we hadn't even given that a thought, but when Kate Kendall from the National Center for... Uh, lesbian rights called us. It was in 2004. And she said, how would you like to get married? And we said, huh? <laughs> you know, what, what? Well, the mayor wants to uh, arrange for gay marriages. And there's a little bit of an argument with his staff and so on. We're not sure, but we think that it would be, you and Dale should be the first ones to get married. And we said, well, let us know when you find out what's going on. And so we talked about it and said, I guess we could do that, you know. And uh, What was your reasoning, given that you hadn't agreed with the idea in general, well, because, in concept? Well, the whole idea was that, that if we could start something and that gay people could get married, then lesbians weren't going to do the same thing men and women did, so what the hell. But there are a lot of advantages to being married. Mm -hmm you know, money advantages yeah. and a whole, whole bunch of advantages. So uh, uh, we didn't hear till the next day. And so the next day she said, okay, we've, we've arranged it. He's not going to do the, they had convinced the mayor he, he was, he'd only been in, in, in office 10 days <laughs> when he started wow. this. And they had convinced him that that was enough and he didn't need to be the one that did the marriage. So they had the, uh, Mabel, Mabel Tang, who was the uh, uh, comptroller, I think. Anyway, so so that's what happened um, on the morning of of um, but then Valentine's what, Day. Right, but Valentine's but then Day. what happened next was that there was a whole I don't know what oh it took ten ten days or something yeah. of, of the. Once Everybody hit, rushing down to City Hall, I think, trying to get yes, married it before, hit the, it before hit the, the door front, closed. It hit, hit the front page of the next day's newspaper. And that picture of Dell and me, <laughs> not only hit that paper, but it went clear around the world. We got calls from my guy in Melbourne, Australia, calls from people in Europe and, and all over. And... Uh, so, <laughs> but at the end of those ten days, those marriages were nullified yeah, essentially. Yeah, right. But so you, the court said no way. Mm -hmm. So, so what did it feel like in two thousand and eight when they called back and said, "Well, we're <laughs> going to try it again. Let's 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 see how we can make it go this time." Deja vu all well, over I, again. Yeah, it was. Although this time, there was a lot. Of, there was some time enough that we could get our family to come to the wedding. So that that which has not been possible at the time before, so that we did have Kendra and Eugene, Dell's daughter, who's now my daughter, and and uh, my sister and, and all our friends and so on, uh, could come and watch it. It was yeah. a lovely event. It you really know, was. Having the 
kind of reception after the fact with everybody standing around yeah. and people who really wanted to say something to the two of you. Many couples came up to the two of you to yeah. thank you, and it was a it was really a beautiful it was a beautiful gathering yeah. after then. Right. So we're kind of coming to the end of this interview, and I'm I'm interested to know. Was there ever a time in this work that you've done, all of the different issues that you've felt so passionately about, was there ever a point where you thought, this is just too much, I just feel burnt out? Well, I don't think so, hon. I think that there were so many different things happening. Uh, we did, we did uh, move away from DOB, for instance, and, and uh, so on. We got more involved in the, na in the National Organization for Women. <coughs> we made it, Dell insisted on running as a lesbian for the board of directors, which was certainly against Betty Friedan's wishes, along with a lot of other people's wishes, and uh, she won anyway because the lesbians and now were for it and uh, so on. So we did, you know, a lot of other things too. But uh, but we were always involved with the le with the gay and lesbian mm -hmm. movement too. No matter what else you were yeah, doing. Yeah. Right. Is there one particular challenge for you in your life in the work that you've done as a lesbian feminist activist? What would you say your largest challenge has been? Oh, dear. Uh, well, I think... I think we haven't reached... I'm not sure what the biggest challenge is, but I think we have reached a lot of... We're much closer to the idea that women are totally equal to men and that's how it should be, and it doesn't matter who they're married to or living with or whatever and so on, that everybody is, is equal, is an equal person. I think we're a lot closer to that, although I don't think we've actually reached it totally. Uh, you can see these days how the, the issue of gays and lesbians, for instance, is not a big problem in San Francisco at all, and in a lot of other places at all, and in a lot of states it's, e it's legal to get married in other states and so on. And in some other states it's totally illegal still. So there's a long way to go. Right. Is there anything you've changed your mind about in the work that you've done and the issues that you've really committed yourself to? Have you changed your mind about anything? Well, I think probably about the issue of marriage, if, if anything. I can't think of anything else. Uh, it's obvious that it's, it should be legal for us to get married and, you know, and, and have all the same. And sti we still don't have. We get married here in California, yes, uh, but we can't get all the benefits that from the federal government. For instance, when Dale died, you know, I don't get her Social Security. And if we were a heterosexual couple, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are, you know, so there's still a long way to go. And a lot of states, including California, don't allow gay marriage. So That's right, not uh, yet. Yet, yeah. As a young person, it was so shocking to me that I had slipped through this set of expectations into a new world. I had no information about it all. I was 15 years old and, you know, in a real brave new world, looking around going, wow, where's this and who am I and what's this all about? So I went to the library and tried mm -hmm. to get information from books and I found this book written by Jess Stern called The Grapevine and in the back of that book was a description of a Daughters of Belitis meeting. And in that description, there was a footnote that said that there was a literary magazine called The Ladder that was associated with, um, with the Daughters of Belitis. Now, I looked for that magazine everywhere. I looked and looked. All my gay and lesbian 
literature all had little brown paper bags. They were all on my bookshelf, but they all had brown paper bags around them. I mean, 15 years old, but I knew I had to hide this, even as I was becoming more whole. And um, I lived in a tiny little town called Lompoc, California, population 5,000. But I came out at a girls' school in Santa Barbara, and my girlfriend um, said she wanted to travel to Berkeley, California to spend a weekend. We're going to have a holiday away. She was one year older than me. And we went to a bookstore called Shakespeare and Company. And this was a very radical bookstore, still is. And they had magazines. They had outlaw magazines there, and I knew they did. And way behind five or six copies of this thing and that thing, I found three copies of a ladder. And I spent an hour and a half walking around the book stacks trying to get the nerve up to put those up on the counter. And I had seven or eight other books, just like you described. I was one of those <laughs> lesbians. And finally thought, this is it. You know, it, it's, it's as bad as buying Kotex. You know, it's worse. I don't know. I mean, whatever it was I was saying to myself, I was so panicked. But I was so desperate to know what was inside those magazines that I, I screwed my courage up and went up there and did that. And I... You know, I, I've heard so many people talk about buying the books, going to the concerts, walking in the bookstores, you know, going to the dance events, going to the poetry readings that lesbians have done in the last 30 years, 40 years in tiny towns and big cities. And But for me, it was the latter. The latter was the first time I ever, you know, took a deep breath and said, this is who I am. This is who I love. I deserve that magazine. I want that magazine close to me. I see my path. If I can just get those magazines, I know that's where my people are. There were poems. There were literary pieces. There were news items. I got the sense that there were lesbians in Kansas City and in Chicago and New York, that it wasn't just a California uh, reality. I, I got a sense of our diversity, even from d just these few magazines. I got the sense that I was a part of a community. Uh, and you, you got it after it, it grew up. I have to also put a point in that Margie has also been a singer, a lesbian singer, and has done concerts all over the, all over the country, all over the world. I, I studied you, and I studied Dell, and I saw what you did, and I saw how you stood in the world, and I simply wanted to be like you, and I wrote music and so my music just had to be about loving women and about being clear about that being just fine and about all of whatever it was that I needed to sing about and what you and Del both taught me was that there's no argument to be made once you accept yourself there's no argument to be had one simply steps into the world fully formed that's what I saw you and Del doing stepping through the world fully formed, not looking for any kind of acceptance, not looking for some kind of approval, but simply being yourselves. And you made a space for me to do the same thing through my music. It's a good thing, because we couldn't sing for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Inez Garcia's, a fundraiser for Inez Garcia at Lone Mountain College in San Francisco in 1975. Mm -hmm. You and Dell came. My manager and lover, Boo Price, had invited you, and she had been working with you, too, around lesbian mother custody issues and also the American Psychiatric Association. She had been our very first lawyer. That's right. Who was. That's exactly right. And she invited the two of you to come and hear this woman who had become her lover at this concert. And I remember the two of you walking down the aisle and me going, oh, I, I, I can't believe that they're here, that, that I am about to meet these two women. And I'm, you know, it's a joy to come to know you and to, to be your friend at this time. But I, I, to put flesh on an idea, you know, is pretty stunning for this <laughs> young person at the time. And it was, uh, it was then. That's when oh, it was. Dear. And I remember seeing you sitting in the front row in the special seats uh, with Dell singing best friend the unicorn song oh and feeling like well this is the ultimate compliment my two lesbian mothers are singing my song <laughs> probably out of tune <laughs> in the long key or whatever